Hello and welcome in to another episode of Locked on Wolves. The Timberwolves beat the Blazers by 43 on Monday night. Today on the show, I'll tell you the biggest takeaway. Obviously, there's several from a massive win, another big Carl Anthony Towns game. Uh, but there's one thing the Timberwolves did that continues to impress me that they've done consistently over the past couple of weeks. We'll get into that here on the show. Welcome in. You are Locked on Wolves. <laughs> You are Locked On Timberwolves, your daily Minnesota Timberwolves podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome into another episode of Locked On Wolves. My name is Ben Beacon. I'm the host of Locked On Wolves. I'm also the editor of Dunking With Wolves, the Timberwolves site. On the fan side of network, happy Tuesday, everybody. This is a victory Tuesday after the Timberwolves beat the Blazers on Monday night by 43. The second win over Portland in uh, two, or I guess in three days, a little over 48 hours at Target Center. We're going to break it all down here on the show today. First of all, though, a quick reminder to follow Lockdown Wolves on Apple, Google, Spotify, the all new Odyssey app, or I should say to, to, well, follow, listen, subscribe, whatever it is you'd like to do on all those podcasts. Also, a reminder that uh, that Lockdown Wolves is available everywhere. That includes YouTube. Um, and I thank you for making Lockdown Wolves your first listen each and every day. You can also follow the show on Twitter at Locked on T Wolves and at B Beacon. And that's with two B's, two E's, C K E N. All right. Uh, let's break this game down. I, I want to start. I, I'm starting to do things a little different here on the post game pods. I want to do my, my biggest kind of overarching key takeaway from the game first. Then we'll get into some of the some of the other stuff, kind of the the sub takeaways underneath that here next segment. Before we do individual studs and duds, as we always do. Now this is kind of a tricky one because kind of everything went right for the Wolves. Obviously they won by forty three, and also the context of this game is that Portland is severely undermanned. Now of course so were the Wolves in the sense that D'Angelo Russell didn't play, Anthony Edwards didn't play, uh, Jalen Noel uh, got injured in the, in the second quarter, took an elbow to the nose and left the game. Uh, with what the Wolves called a nasal contusion, only played 12 minutes. Um, so the Wolves are missing two members of their big three, of course, but they also had the best player on the floor by a wide margin, Carl Anthony Towns. And frankly, they probably had the best two or three players on the floor. The Blazers, uh, I mean, this is probably the nicest way to put it, had a, a bunch of kind of fringe NBA guys on their team playing in this game. No Anthony Simons. He missed, or excuse me, on Saturday, he, he scored 38 points against the Wolves. He missed this one due to a quad contusion. So, I mean, you know, outside of Josh Hart, who, of course, came over in the trade with uh, with New Orleans, not, you know, just a few weeks ago, um, he had played quite well for them of late. He did not play well in this game, but he was kind of the only guy coming into this game that you're like, OK, this guy could maybe hurt us. Brandon Williams played well against the Wolves Saturday as well, and he was solid in this one, too. He was their best player, Portland's best player on the floor. Uh, ben McLemore, the veteran, of course, off the bench, only played eight minutes. It was really just kind of a, a limited, um, a limited number of actual NBA players for Portland. So yeah, the Wolves won by 43, but you know, they won by 43 against a team that had uh, not, um, you know, they didn't have, they didn't have their guys on the floor. We'll, we'll say that. However, there's still a key takeaway uh, from this thing for me. And that is that the Timberwolves continue to play extremely hard against teams that they should beat. And maybe that's, that's kind of a lame key takeaway, but if you've watched the Timberwolves for at any length of time over the past few years, you know that even when they've been a not great team themselves, they'll win a game or two, maybe even beat a good team. And then they turn around and the next time out against a team that they feel like they should beat, they lay down and they get stumped. Um, I mean, that happened early last year, right? Even in the opener last season, when they ended up not being a very good team, of course, firing their coach mid season, they played the Pistons in the first game. The Pistons were expected to be about the worst team in the league. The Wolves were thought of to be a fringe playoff team. The Wolves barely scraped by with the win against the Pistons in the season opener. And, and there were just tons of examples of that last season where it was one step forward, two steps back with disappointing losses to bad teams or just laying flat and just getting getting absolutely laid flat, actually, um, against teams that really shouldn't have been that much better than the Wolves. Now, this year, they're actually playing well, and especially of late, against teams that they should beat. Uh, and I think that's significant. Um, they did not play their best game in this one. And we'll get into the numbers here in a little bit. But, I mean, think of it, at the Wolves three-point percentage in this game was 30%. They were 13 of 43 from outside the arc. They actually committed 20 turnovers in this game, three more than the Blazers. 
Um, and I don't know. There were plenty of problems with how the Timberwolves played in this one, but they won by 43. They only give up 81 points to an NBA team. Uh, granted, a depleted NBA team, but they only give up 81 points, which was their best defensive showing in a really long time. But now they beat the Blazers by double digits twice in three days. They beat the Thunder by 37 on Friday. These are all games they should have won. They also beat a somewhat depleted Cavs team. They beat a banged up Warriors team during this five game winning streak. Those games were obviously still a little bit tougher. Um, and I mean, you go back a couple of weeks and the Wolves were still largely beating the teams they should have beaten. They had those four consecutive games against the Pistons and Kings. They went three and one during that stretch. So you take the Pistons, Kings, Thunder, Blazers over the past uh, couple of weeks, you're going back to just before the All-Star break. And the Wolves have have gone through those games at, at with a five and one record. That's exactly what you would expect them to do. But if you or if you're somebody who's watched the Wolves over the past several seasons, Maybe you didn't expect them to do that. And this version of the Timberwolves is actually coming to play. They're not treating uh, this like, hey, we just, you know, we've clinched the division or we just want a playoff game or whatever. Every time that they that they win a game, this is a much more business like approach. And at the same time, Chris Finch has been able to rest his best players. He's been able to rest the likes of Anthony Edwards, who obviously is banged up. But something tells me if this were a playoff game, he's probably out on the floor playing. Uh, same with D'Angelo Russell. He looked just fine on Saturday. No worse for the wear. He's had a few nagging injuries all year. Let him sit. Pat Bev sat the second half of a back-to-back -back on Saturday. Um, they've been able to give these guys some time off. Prince didn't play in the second half Saturday because of back spasms, but he played on Monday. So the Wolves have been able to kind of, uh, it, I guess, load manage, if you will, some of these guys, rest some of, you know, real injuries, but actually give them some rest to, to, to try and heal up all the while still beating up on teams that they should beat. Now, of course, it helps that Carl Anthony Towns has been the best player on the floor in every single one of these games, except for, I guess, the Golden State game when Steph Curry played. But I mean, you'd have to go back to the Sixers loss, which was a blowout loss a week and a half ago, um, to find another team that had, uh, you know, a couple of guys who could say that they were better than the Wolves' two best players, uh, you know, obviously with Embiid and, and James Harden. Um, but I, I don't know. I mean, the, the Wolves are doing exactly what you expect them to do. The level to which they're competing um, and, and I guess the second piece of this, it's not simply that they're winning by double digits. It's the way that they, they grind out some of these games. Like again, in this one with all the turnovers, the bad shooting percentage for the wolves, um, it, it was a solid defensive performance, but on, uh, but it was just really kind of the consistent effort scrambling for loose balls. Uh, the tone that was set by Patrick Beverly from really the opening tip, uh, Malik Beasley jumping passing lanes, getting a, a breakaway, a steal, a breakaway and one dunk in the open floor. McDaniels and Jared Vanderbilt doing their thing in the passing lanes. Uh, Jordan McLaughlin continuing to just seemingly be everywhere. He had six steals in Saturday's win. And he only had two in this one. He had a couple of other deflections that easily could have been steals. Uh, just the overall general activity level. Offensive rebounds, 19 for the Timberwolves. Um, we'll get to Carl Anthony Towns here in a minute, but he was, uh, I mean, not virtually unstoppable. He was unstoppable in this game. The only thing that that he struggled with was, <coughs> excuse me, was making free throws. Um, and he was so good uh, in every other facet of the game. Um, so what I want to do next is I want to get into uh, into some key takeaways, uh, additional key takeaways. And actually, before we do that, one more thing. Um, Alan Horton, the Timberwolves' fantastic radio play-by-play -play voice or radio voice in general, said after the game on Twitter, I, I want to read this. This is a couple of different ways uh, that we can, oh, I lost it here. There's a couple of different ways that we can, um, that we can kind of break down how well the wolves have played of late. I'm going to find the exact, uh, the exact tweet here. Okay. Here's a couple of different ways to look at it. The wolves have won five games in a row. They've won eight out of 10. They've won 13 of 17 and 21 of 30 or 21 and nine in their last 30 games. Overall, since starting the season four, and nine, Alan Horton po points out that the Timberwolves are 33 and 20 since that four and nine start. Uh, there's no two ways about it. The Timberwolves are playing some of the best basketball in the NBA going back now several weeks. And certainly we could talk about since the first of the year, uh, which is which is pretty close to that that 30 game mark. Um, I guess it's well, maybe not quite. I guess that's more like 20 some games since the first of the year. But um, I mean, we've been talking about how the Wolves have had the league's best offense since the first of the year. And that continues to be true. Um, in fact, this was on the Fox Sports uh, or excuse me, Valley Sports North guys said this. The Wolves score have scored the most points over the last five games than any team in the NBA has scored in any five game stretch all season. Um, yes, they played some bad defenses. Well, the Thunder aren't that bad of a defense. They've been in there a couple of times, too, um, or I guess one time they'll face them again on Wednesday. But in general, the Timberwolves have been fantastic over the past several weeks. OK, let's get into some additional key takeaways from this game 
in addition to the uh the 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 hustle and the overall just kind of uh the stick to itiveness of the Timberwolves in these games that you know they easily could just assume are going to be easy. Uh beyond that, I've got some other takeaways from this one. First of all, let's talk about our friends at Bet Online. Football might be over for this season, but basketball is in full steam ahead for both pro and college hoops. From all the latest odds, totals, player performance props to where the next fired coach might land, betonline.net is the number one spot for all your sports betting needs. BetOnline remains the best spot for all your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. And it's not just basketball. BetOnline.net is your source for hockey, boxing, UFC odds, and more. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action. BetOnline, where the game starts. All right, thanks again for making Lockdown Wolves your first listen each and every day. For your next listen, check out the Lockdown Now podcast, nightly recaps of every NBA game with analysis from our local experts, including yours truly. Each uh, Lockdown host will recap the their game from that night in about a minute to a minute and a half. Uh, those will all get published on the Lockdown Now podcast feed. It's a great way to catch up on all the action without having to sit through an entire highlight show, and you'll get a different take on it from each Lockdown Now host, as, or Lockdown host, I should say, as well. Lockdown Now is free and available wherever you listen to podcasts. Okay. Let's talk additional takeaways from this game. Uh, let's talk about Carl Anthony Towns. He was phenomenal once again, as he continues the best extended stretch of play, two-way play on both ends of the floor uh, in his NBA career. He was fantastic. 27 points in 24 minutes on just 14 shots of this game. 27 on eight of 14 shooting, made his only three-point attempt, 10 of 15 on free throw attempts in 24 minutes, had 13 rebounds, one assist, one steal, two blocks, only two turnovers and two personal fouls, was a game high plus 34. By the way, nobody else on the Wolves in a game they won by 43 was better than a plus 23. Cat was a plus 34 in 24 minutes. The Blazers didn't have a single person that had a prayer of checking Carl Anthony Towns in this game. I mean, poor Drew Eubanks uh, was trying to kind of hang with him down low. Uh, I mean, uh, Trendon Watford, same thing. I, I just, it, it, they just really had no chance of slowing down one of the league's best big men. And Towns maintained his composure. Uh, although I will say, I don't know that we're actually starting to see the corner turn. And, and maybe maybe we are. I hope we are. But Cat's getting some foul calls now. And, and to be fair, I think he was fouled every time he went to the free throw line. But some of these calls are calls that we have not seen him get in the past. And I don't know if it's because the Wolves are winning. I don't know if it's because... Uh, Towns has kept his composure in general better of late. I know the Wolves have made some noise. Chris Finch has been very loud about how Towns, he doesn't understand how Towns can shoot 20 times a game and not get called uh, and not get to the free throw line, which has happened a couple of times this year, believe it or not. Um, but 27 on 14 shots in 24 minutes. Great composure. <coughs> excuse me. Great composure on both ends of the floor for Cat and uh, 13 rebounds. Again, the double double by halftime. Just a great performance and so good to see him effective uh, uh, defensively as well. And the Wolves have been playing a lot more drop coverage lately in pick and roll uh, coverage. And uh, he's seemed more comfortable than he ever did in the old pick and roll defense that they ran under David Vanterpool and Ryan Saunders. And I don't know if it's just because he gets to play different coverages and then can really lock in on, you know, if it's just trying some different things and he's just more engaged because he has to really kind of think about like what coverage are we in right now based on the situation and the personnel that the opposing team has. The Wolves played a lot of drop against a Blazers team with really no outside shooting threats. The Blazers were 7 of 28 on threes in this game, 25% three-point shooting attempts uh, on three-point shooting attempts, 27.7% in general from the field. The Wolves were dare daring the Blazers to shoot from the perimeter by playing a lot of drop coverage, and, and Towns was effective in it. It looked really comfortable. Uh, along with that, the defense didn't get lazy. This goes a little bit with my main takeaway off the top. But the Wolves played hard, uh, jumping passing lanes, uh, you know, maintaining the integrity really of, of guarding their lanes, I thought was really important. Uh, you know, jumping the gap and trying to trying to uh, cut off dribble penetration. And the Wolves did that at the same time as they were still doing a good job of contesting in the perimeter and also rebounded too. Um, the Wolves grabbed what 67 rebounds, the Blazers 42. They were a plus 25 on the defensive glass, or uh, sorry, on the glass overall in this game, a plus 25 on the glass. And I mentioned uh, the defensive glass. Let's let's talk about offensive rebounding. The Timberwolves offensively, or on the offensive glass, grabbed 19 rebounds in this game. 19 offensive rebounds, which is just a function of activity more than anything else. Um, also, they missed a lot of shots, but uh, 
And of those 19, Carl Anthony Towns had seven of those boards. Nobody else had more than two. But again, it was general activity uh, of, of everybody that played for the Wolves. And they played what? They played 12 guys in this game. Uh, eight of them grabbed at least one offensive rebound. So overall, general activity, uh, playing hard on both ends of the floor was so obvious in this game. And it was such a big deal. Um, offensively, the Timberwolves just continue to click all the way around. Um, it, it's all about continuous movement. And, and we've talked a lot about how Chris Finch's offense is so much more free flowing. Uh, it allows for players to read and react so much more than some of the other offenses we've seen the Wolves run in past seasons under previous head coaches. Uh, but the trust that the Wolves have in each other, the extra passes that are being made, um, even if there's guys like Jordan McLaughlin or Jade McDaniels or, or even, I mean, I guess Torian Prince has been a lot better lately, but McDaniels and McLaughlin are the best examples. Uh, guys who maybe haven't shot the three super well most of the season, uh, but their teammates believe that they're going to make the next one. And lo and behold, the likes of Torian Prince and even D'Angelo Russell and uh, across the board, Malik Beasley is a, is the best example. These guys are all starting to shoot the ball better from three. Eventually, the Timberwolves were going to progress to the mean in terms of their individual three-point shooting percentages. And we're seeing the fruits of that now as the Wolves offensively are, are just being, they're just having that, uh, that trust. The ball movement's continuing, even when three-pointers aren't falling. This game's a great example of that as well, shooting 30% from three. But yet the ball kept moving until the open guy was found. And even if they missed, they were getting a ton of offensive rebounds and they just played the right way offensively. And that led to scoring 124 points in a, in just a, a regulation 48 minute game. My last takeaway uh, is related to the Timberwolves depth once again. And, and this was a game where depth maybe wasn't really as important. Um, I talked about it in regards to the Thunder game on Friday when the Thunder starters, you know, are, are, fine i mean even even given some of the injuries no josh giddy etc uh but the thunder bench was not a real nba bench and the wolves bench was able to crush them that was the case in this one too again it didn't really matter because the the portland starters were arguably even worse than what the thunder rolled out there uh certainly no no player on on par with a shea gilgis alexander like okc had on friday or even uh when anthony simons was available on saturday for portland uh but the wolves depth continues to be so impressive i mean torian prince was able to play in this game but didn't play great um, so the Wolves tried it out. You know, uh, Jalen Noel was great until he got hurt. Uh, Nas Reed was it didn't do much in the first half. He got into some foul trouble, but played the whole fourth quarter and, and ended up with 18 and 11, just dominating the Blazers reserves. Uh, the depth of this team is going to continue to be a really important thing. We saw Josh Akogi come into this game in the third quarter. I think he played the last 20 minutes of the game for the Wolves. And uh, I mean, it wouldn't shock me if we see a little more Josh Akogi moving forward in some spot minutes defensively to keep him fresh. For the stretch run, there's going to be some games and we see teams do this, even if the rotation itself is generally shortened to eight, maybe nine guys. There's there's teams that there's coaches that in the playoffs will bring in a guy for two, three, four minutes at a time to get a stop to to really slow down a, a good, you know, a, a good ball handler, a good perimeter player for an opposing team in the playoffs in a long series. Right. To give some teams different looks, to give some different guys opportunities. Josh Okogie could be a guy that that sees a fringe rotation role down the stretch of the season. And he's played pretty well uh, in garbage time the other night, 20 minutes in this game, nine points, four of seven shooting, a couple of rebounds, a couple of steals, including one that he got immediately after checking into the game in the third quarter. Um, but in general, the Timberwolves depth continues to impress and it's going to uh, continue to play a role in the playoff race here down the stretch of the regular season. All right, let's close the show by doing individual studs and duds. We're going to get to that here next. All right, individual studs and duds. The Wolves, of course, won by 43. So uh, nobody on the teams played more than 28 minutes in this one. Um, and only two guys played 26 or more minutes. That being Beasley playing 28, McDaniels playing 26. It's kind of, it's difficult to really assign true studs and duds because there was so much garbage time, but I'll give it a go. Uh, obviously the best player on the floor. I already talked about him. Carl Anthony Towns, 27 points on 14 shots in just 24 minutes. 8 of 14 shooting, just 10 of 15 at the free throw line. Was really kind of struggling with his with his uh, free throw shot or shot from the free throw line. One of one on three point attempts, 13 rebounds, two blocks, a steal and assist. And uh, again, a game high plus 34 in a game where nobody else had better than a, a, a plus 23 mark. Second stud has to be Patrick Beverly. Yeah. He only played 22 minutes. He only scored six points, but if you watch this game, he was, I, I mean, I guess you could say co MVP with Carl Anthony towns. He was everywhere in the first quarter. There was one possession where he got a block and I can't remember who it was in the Blazers. I think he got the ball back. 
on the right side of the floor as the shot clock was winding down and Beverly stripped the ball before he could go up for a shot. It was a shot clock violation, Timberwolves ball, all in the same possession. Uh, Beverly ended with 10 rebounds. He was the starting point guard in this game. No, no D'Angelo Russell, 10 rebounds in just 22 minutes, seven assists for Patrick Beverly, the one block and uh, three, just three turnovers to the, to the seven assists, six points on two, seven shooting it was one of five on threes, got to the free throw line uh, once and was one of two at the line. Uh, you know, the six, seven and 10 line isn't, uh, I mean, it's, it's not all too sexy, right? It's, it's not all that close to a triple double. The two of seven shooting isn't great, but the activity level, the tone setting for Patrick Beverly in a game where the wolves could have came into this thing thinking, eh, we'll win this game easily. Or maybe woe is us. Cause we don't have Dilo. We don't have Ant. those were both possibilities. And Pat Bev made sure to set the tone early and him and Carl Anthony towns are the reason the primary reasons together why the Timberwolves were able to build a massive, what was it, 61 to like 34 lead at halftime. It was like a 17 or 27 point halftime lead, uh, which is just incredible. And those were the guys that were able to do that. Uh, those are the two starters that belong in that category. I'm going to give a stud to Jordan McLaughlin as well. So good off the bench in this game. 11 points on four of eight shooting, six assists, two steals, three rebounds, one block, just two turnovers uh, for J-Mac in 20 minutes. Again, four of eight shooting, one of three on threes, two of three at the free throw line. It felt like he had more than two steals. He had multiple deflections that easily could have resulted in steals. Uh, was just an absolute menace defensively. And, and he has been that uh, really, really since the first year, since he rejoined the rotation. I guess he was never really in the rotation early in the year, except for when d was hurt. Uh, but since he's become a mainstay in the rotation, Jordan McLaughlin has been so good defensively and so solid on offense. Even if he's not, you know, he's a below average three-point shooter, he isn't ultra quick, although he's an okay finisher at the rim for his size and stature. He's so good defensively and such a, a reliable force on offense. Uh, force isn't the right word. A reliable, uh, I don't know, steadying force, maybe reliable, uh, you know, orchestrator of the offense. Uh, there's a little bit of Tyus Jones to his game in that regard. He doesn't really play all that similarly, but in the sense that he's kind of at this point, a defense first steady hand offensively. Um, I, you know, there's some similarities there, uh, in, in how he runs the team off the bench. Those are your three studs hard to pinpoint a dud in a game that the wolves won by 43. Um, I, I mean, there really isn't one. I mean, I don't know. I mean, Torian Prince, I guess had five points. I guess we'll give it to Torian and we got to name one. It's been a while since I've actually named one. The wolves have been playing so well lately, five points in 17 minutes, but he shot two of nine, one of six on threes. And he had four turnovers, three fouls committed in 17 minutes. So not a good game for Torian Prince. He had the worst plus minus on the team with a plus eight, which tells you how good the wolves played. Uh, but eh, not a good game for Torian. That's fine. Didn't need it. They won by 43. Uh, so next up for the wolves, it, it, putting a bow on this one. I, I think I, I finished where I started. Um, they won by 43. It was because they played hard. They set the tone early. Beverly Towns Blazers had no answer for Towns. Defense was good. The Blazers didn't have any, uh, not only no answer for Towns on one end of the floor, the Blazers just had nobody that could generate offense on their offensive end of the floor outside of Brandon Williams. He was the only guy that on this team that shot, you know, reasonable percentage from the floor really, um, and had any impact on the game positively for them. Um, so at any rate, next up for the Wolves, they have Tuesday off. They stay home to play the Thunder on Wednesday. Of course, just saw the Thunder and OKC on Friday. Um, and then things get difficult at Orlando Friday night, obviously a winnable game, although the Wolves never seem to play that well in Orlando. Then at Miami in the second night of a back-to-back -back on Saturday at San Antonio Monday home for the Lakers next week. So I guess, you know, starting with that road trip three out or yeah, three out of the next four are very winnable too. So we could be looking at a situation where the Wolves have like one eight out of 10 or something like that. That's entirely feasible, but then a murderer's row schedule. After that, now we're getting into mid-March. Milwaukee, Dallas, Phoenix, Dallas, Boston, Toronto, Denver. Those are all playoff teams, and most of them are likely top five seeds in their respective conferences. Uh, and then things finish a little bit easier. Houston, Washington, San Antonio before the last game of the season is against the, the uh, very good Chicago Bulls. So once we get through this stretch here with Oklahoma City, Orlando, San Antonio, Lakers, things get tough for Minnesota. They need to bank as many of these wins as they can, and, and they're now eight games above 500. Um, and they're, they're hoping for some assistance, you know, Denver beat golden state, Denver won again. Um, you know, they're just not getting much help with the teams around them. Dallas won again too. Um, but make as many of these wins as you can hope you can get hot against the really good teams down the stretch of this season and have a shot at getting out of the seven spot. But if nothing else, the wolves are keeping pace with the Clippers right behind them who have been playing well, Denver and Dallas right in front of them who have been playing well. 
and just further cementing their position at, at number seven and hanging around for the possibility of getting up to six uh, down the stretch of the season. All right, that's all we have for today here on the show. Thanks again for listening to Locked On Wolves, of course, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Thank you again for making Locked On Wolves your first listen each and every day. Of course, you can listen to this show anywhere. That includes YouTube as well as Apple, Google, Spotify, Odyssey. You can also follow on Twitter at Locked On T Wolves and my account at, at B Beacon with two B's, two E's, C K E N. Also, a, uh, a reminder. As long as you're making this your first listen, which we greatly appreciate, you can make your second listen Locked On NBA. Locked On experts covering the biggest stories around the NBA every Monday through Friday in less than 30 minutes. It's free and available wherever you get podcasts. Once again, I'm Ben Beacon. This is the Locked On Wolves podcast, and we'll catch you next time.